Hello and welcome. This is Heavy Business. I'm Aaliyah. And I'm Corey. That's right. Corey is back. As you may have noticed, last month we had her on uh, helping me interview Dan Mausch, which was quite fantastic. Um, and today I just really wanted to take this opportunity to talk to Corey. Um, you know, Corey, you've been kind of absent from the podcast for, I think, over a year, maybe. Not Something two, along those lines. Not two, but I think over a year. And so, and a lot's been going on in your life since you stopped being a host on the podcast, but you have not left the company and you've always been, um, we've been present and talking over the course of this time, but, um, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to just kind of dive into what has been developing in your life, how your career has shifted, um, over the last couple of years. So when we left you last, you were, I think at the time when you were on the podcast last, you were still writing for metal injection and that was a while ago. So what's happened since then? And where are you at now? Well, I no longer write for metal injection. Love those guys. Love you, Greg. Shout out to Greg. Um, <laughs> But I am the managing editor for NotFest, so I handle a lot of the editorial coverage there, and I run a lot of the festival crews. Um, so anybody you see interviewing people at festivals or people you see at the merch booths at festivals, it's me usually making sure those people don't die or they, you know, get their water and their food and everything like that. And I'm I'm usually running myself ragged during those times, but thankfully it's only a few times a year. And then. Uh, in addition to that, obviously, I'm still at C squared. Uh, I'm still one of the two co founders of C squared, I'm handling a lot of uh, press releases, both for independent bands, all the way up to bands that are on Century Media, who's one of the uh, clients that we acquired over the past year, which is great. A uh, lot of fun working with the Century Media crew and a lot of their bands. Uh, we have some new exciting announcements coming out this week. Some, a new album is getting announced. A new single is getting announced from one of my favorite death metal bands. So I am stoked on that. And then from there, <laughs> I'm still uh, managing bands. That's another thing that I did when I left the podcast. Uh, well, not really. I took a break, an extended hiatus from the podcast. Um, but I'm still managing bands. Uh, I have Lutharo on my roster right now, who has an album coming out in March. Um, I have Four Stroke Baron, who's on Prosthetic Records. I don't know how many people know that band, but if you don't, go check them out. Any way I try to describe that band is going to be reductive because they're just, they're different. It's a different band. Uh, and that one was really cool for me to pick up because they were actually my 20, one of my, I believe, 2020 or 2021 albums of the year something along those lines. So it was a cool full, full circle moment there. Um, Lutharo was also one of my albums of the year when I was writing at Metal Injection. So I'm just picking up all of my albums of the year uh, on my management roster. And then I'm also working with Satanic Tea Company. Um, just, I, I love those guys. It is a hilarious project. It's a lot of fun. Um, and we'll hopefully have some great developments on their end this year as well. And then... <laughs> <laughs> I've also many, taken many, many hats still. Many hats. Um, I have taken over as the head of marketing for Raining Phoenix Music, which is the U.S. counterpart to Atomic Fire. Uh, I started that job last month, and it is again, it's a lot of fun. It's it's challenging because it's a it's a new label, but with a lot of veteran people, so you get a lot of knowledge, but still. There's the chaos of being new. Uh, we also put out a song on Christmas Day, which was all sorts of chaos making that happen. Because in that situation, if something goes wrong, the distributors are closed, the social media people are closed, uh, like everybody is closed. So if anything goes wrong, there's nobody to fix it. <laughs> um, but the song did really well. That was the new DSI track, obviously, where it's... Quite a bit blasphemous if you haven't seen the video and you want a good chuckle if you appreciate a little bit of gore and find that that funny then go check it out we also released um the sebastian bach single that came out early december just after he was revealed as one of the contestants on the mass singer so that's another fun release and we've got even more stuff legendary bands coming to the label it's going to be great what is your role over at uh, raining phoenix I'm Did the head of marketing. 
head of marketing. Head so of marketing. Now we've got two people working in the marketing departments. I work in marketing department at my job. So, um, but it's very different. And I know that you are, well, why don't you describe everything kind of that falls under that, that, that umbrella at a record label? What falls on under the marketing umbrella? So obviously print and digital advertising, primarily digital, but um, particularly over in Europe, there is still a market for print. Um, and there's still a few outlets here too in the US where print is important, but a lot of digital marketing. So your Google ads, YouTube, social media ads that you see on Facebook and um, Instagram, uh, TikTok, all of that. Uh, depending on the band, uh, it can include social media management. It can include website management. Uh, it just depends on how big of a team the band has on their side versus the needs that we have on our side and making those two things um, align. So if the band has a smaller team, then obviously we're going to help more. If they've got a big team because they're a big band, then we don't have quite as much that we have to do. Um Obviously, we still have a lot to do, but I generally won't be like making their social media posts for them or anything like that. Um, and then I do have an assistant that helps me, which is great. Uh, and then things like email blasts, website updates, um, marketing events for the label itself, not just our bands, but the label. So uh, things like we have a booth at Comic-Con where we will be promoting the labels, bands and everything like that in the label itself. So yeah, really Comic-Con, um, huh? Yeah. Comic-Con. And then on-site marketing, I have a lot of fun plans for that. Um, coming up in the next year, as the label grows, more releases start coming out because again, we've this particular label, even though it is the atomic fire counterpart, RPM only has two releases out right now, which is those two singles that came out in December. So as we grow, so do the marketing efforts and you'll start seeing a lot more stuff that I've put together. <laughs> well, we're excited to see all of that. Um, one thing that you mentioned that I think would be kind of fun to dive into a little bit would be the social media digital ads. If you're open to uh, describing that a little bit, uh, I know you said we were we were just kind of casual ta casually talking earlier today about like specific benchmarks that you guys have to determine whether um, a campaign is by your term successful or not, mm -hmm. um, that you're aiming for. And you don't, if you, if you're open to explaining those benchmarks and how you achieve them, I think that would be really interesting for people to hear about. Oh, of course. So, um, with any kind of ads, there are generally average metrics for your industry, uh, that are that kind of gauge what general performance should look like. So when you're setting up your ad and you're choosing things like your audience parameters, your budget, um, and where you want the ads to display, you generally want to start pretty broad to see how things work and then start narrowing it down until you start hitting those benchmarks. So your first day running ads is probably going to be your worst day running ads because you haven't fine tuned anything. You haven't tailored anything you haven't really allowed the algorithm to learn where where your audience is and what they respond to so it's a it's a mix between machine learning and human learning and so like i said your first day is going to be your worst day your first ads are never ever ever going to be the best ads that you've ever put out but as you fine tune things those benchmarks start to or the, those, uh, those metrics start to go up to meeting the benchmarks. So benchmarks that I look at are things like uh, view rate. So how many people are sticking around to view the ad? This is something that is important in Google ads, um, particularly YouTube ads. So people are shown the ad and then they get that, you know, five seconds to skip. Um, anybody who sticks around for, I believe it's 30 seconds, it is what affects your view rate. So the higher that is, the more people are sticking around to see your ad, which means your audience is in line. You're reaching people who want to see your ad. Um, if it's too low, then you're not reaching the right people. Generally, the average or the, the minimum benchmark I, I like to see on those is 30%. So 30% of the people that you show the ad to, they should be looking at the ad. Uh, typically, once I get mine dialed in, I don't generally slip below 50%. One of my bands that I run ads for, I've been running them forever. 
uh, I fine tuned it to the point where now I'm at 80% of the people that I show the ad to stick around to watch it. Damn, Uh, that's solid. I know I'm one of those people that always skips the ad pretty much. So (laughs) I'm like, there's got to be people like that. But that took over a year of fine tuning to get to that. Um, But even now, once I have kind of learned where the audience fits, even those first day metrics are still above that 30%. Um, Because if you're advertising similar products, you can reuse similar audiences and hit those benchmarks. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, And then things like uh, cost per conversion. Now, a conversion is somebody doing something that you want them to do. It could be clicking through to your Spotify to stream more of your music. It could be visiting your website. It could be buying something. It is whatever your call to action is. It's that person going and doing that thing. So you want that number to be low because that means you're reaching people who want your stuff very, very easily. If that number is high, it means you're paying a lot to get people to come in and actually buy your things. Um, average for that one, you want it to be kind of below a quarter. So 25 cents. And um, the lower that number is, the better, but it has to also be in line with other metrics that um support that. So say you have a really low cost per conversion, but you also have a low conversion rate. So that's how many people see the ad versus how many people are actually going and doing the thing you want them to do. So you have a lot of people seeing the ad, but not very many people are clicking through. Those people that click through are pretty cheap. What that means is you're generally targeting markets that are inexpensive. So countries that don't typically spend a lot. So the bid strategy on ads is lower. Uh, All ads are based on bids. So the more desirable the market, the higher the bid. So the US is expensive. Uh, The Philippines is not expensive. So when you get a low cost, but a low um, conversion rate, it means you're targeting countries or markets or segments that aren't very expensive, but also are not very engaged. So you want those to be more balanced and more in line. It's okay to pay a little bit more to reach the right people, to get the people who will actually, you know, stream your music, purchase your physical albums, things like that. So it's kind of making sure that everything falls within a nice, even balanced uh, performance strategy to really optimize everything. Yeah. And I almost think that view rate from my perspective, is it from your perspective as well, that the view rate is more important than the cost per click or cost per conversion? It really depends on what your goal is. If your goal is reach and awareness, then yes, view rate is extremely important. If your goal is um, follow through to streaming more music or buying something, purchasing tickets to your show, then your view rate can be lower as long as your conversion rate is higher. Hmm. You don't want your view rate to be too low because that means you're not reaching enough people who are interested, but you still want your conversion rate to be higher because that means you're reaching people interested enough to buy something. Got you. So it kind of depends, like, I guess from my perspective, like for, for Shield of Wings, for example, I'm always thinking about awareness because mm-hmm. we're not because we're not very known. And so it might be a more well-known band. You would actually be looking at the other number more, perhaps. Correct. So for a band that's growing, reaching as many people as you can and getting them engaged is the best thing that you can do. So view rate is going to be very important. You want to reach as many people as possible that will actually Focus on what it is you're trying to show them, whether it's your music video, your latest single, things like that. Um, Whereas an established band, let's just say Ghost is putting out an ad. Um, Everybody's going to go watch their video anyway. (laughs) They want people to do more. So they're going to be looking at the other metrics. That makes total sense. That makes total sense. Now, are there still certain platforms that you prefer for advertising different kinds of bands? Not necessarily different kinds of bands, but different goals. Um, So YouTube is great for that awareness, like we said, because you can advertise your videos. You can get them right in front of people right away. Uh, Spotify is great if your goal is to grow your streaming numbers and your streaming audience, which then would in turn boost, hopefully, 
your other platforms, things like concert attendance and all of that. Um, Facebook is good for physical product, anything that's visual that you can show people that is quick and easy to digest. So not something as long as a music video, but maybe a nice animated graphic showcasing your new album artwork, things like that, that is like five seconds, just something quick and easy to digest to really capture people's attention and get them to click through. And that's you- true with pretty much, you know, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of those ones, you want it quick and easy to digest. And then search campaigns through Google ads, not YouTube, but, you know, banner ads, that's going to be something that's eye catching um, and very, very targeted. But that's another one where it's going to be quick and easy to digest. You don't want something that's big and long. You want it to be like a a flash to really capture the eye and get them to, oh, I want to click on this and find out what this is. That's one of the things that I designed for my job is, um, what do we call them? Remarketing ads. Mm -hmm. Um, So I actually design those for our ad campaigns and we just do Mm -hmm. image-based advertising. Do you... Is it primarily primarily just uh, still images? Still images are good. Uh, I've also experimented with carousels, which are nice. I see a lot of clothing companies doing those, and they're always very nicely eye-catching. Um, something that's got a little bit of animation to it, like a, a longer GIF, also works quite nicely just because there's so much going on on a web page at any given time. That little bit of a flash or movement will draw the eye in. It doesn't have to be something completely crazy, but just enough to be like, oh, wait a minute. What was that? Totally. How do you, is that, is that even something that bands can do on their own? Or do you think it's not really worthwhile for bands to do that type of marketing on on their own? Uh, I do think bands should learn to do it on their own, but I do think it is one of the last steps that they should take. Uh, They should have everything else in line first. So your website, your socials, um, all of your your branding so quality band photos quality album art actually having all of your music ready to go things like that you shouldn't be dumping a thousand dollars on ads promoting one single when you're a brand new band it's your debut single that kind of stuff you need to build up the band first otherwise there's not going to be a remarketing campaign because you don't have an audience to remarket to yet. There's not going to be any algorithmic learning through Google or through Facebook because you don't have an audience for them to learn from yet. And you yourself to manually learn what your audience is and what they like, you haven't built that yet to start to really understand where to market and where your fans are. You need to establish yourself a little bit, build up some audience just so you can understand where to start with your ads because you need that knowledge to have a jumping off point. Yeah, I think that's a really important point because I do think there's a lot of temptation to really think about, like depending on a person's personality type, there's a lot of temptation to think about, oh, how am I going to market my music? How am I going to make sure it gets out to the right people when there isn't anything finished to market yet? And you really need to be focusing on creating your music. And I, I definitely... I'm, I've seen that in friends of mine. I feel like I am that way. If I was the songwriter for our band, I would be that way. Um, Just because that's, I like to think about the technical aspects of things, but it it really is like people listening to this podcast. Don't even worry about this. If you're still working on your album, right? It's like, just work on your music. Yes. Just work on your music. Get that done. Then work on your artwork. Get that done. Get your merch done. Get your website done done. Get your socials done. Yes. Including TikTok to everybody who is listening. Do not resist the TikTok. Like I want to start going around and slapping bands and just saying, get a TikTok. Um, Do it. Do it. Uh, Because the best kind of marketing when you are starting out is organic. Uh, You can't forget that not all marketing is paid. When you make a social media post, that's marketing. When you send an email blast to your fans, that's marketing. Uh, When you attend a show and hand out stickers for your band, that's marketing. And it's very low cost marketing. And it'll help build your audience and your fan base up for the paid marketing to then grow that audience. Yeah, super super important Mm -hmm. to remember. I mean, I still have one of the CDs 
that I was handed by a band that was opening for what I think it was corn. Um, so this would have been 2004. This had been 20 years ago, almost. I still have the CD that they were handing out at the show. Now I know that that's not something that people typically do nowadays, but who doesn't love getting a sticker? You can print a thousand stickers for very, very cheap. Just go hand them out at shows. That's marketing. There's a lot of ways that low cost ways before dumping tons of money into digital ads that you can market your band that are free, organic, or very low cost and would still be considered organic because you're reaching the right people versus throwing a bunch of money into the web and hoping for the best. Right. It's really treacherous territory because it's like, it's very complicated to set up these ads, right? I set my ads up. I set the Shield of Wings ads up for one of our music videos and it was time consuming. And after all of that, they changed the way things are set up and I had to change more things. So it's like really a job to target things properly and market them, right? It is. It is. And I think so the platforms make it deceptively easy. Like you, they make you think it's nice and easy because they give you this nice walk through. You go and you check all your little boxes and boom, you have an ad. But you don't have an ad that's targeted properly. And you don't necessarily have an ad that is going to work its best for you because you haven't yet learned what to target. Yeah. And they all they care about is getting your money. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. No, they don't care whether or not your ad performs because that's on you and how you set it up. But they'll still get their money. So I guess if a band is ready to start with the digital marketing aspect of things, which platform do you think is the best for a smaller band? Um, I am a big fan of YouTube ads because they're nice and visual. They get you right in the right in the faces of people. And they also can get your music right into the ears of people, depending on how you set the ad up. Um, it'll just play naturally through uh, the progression of videos as people are listening and watching. Uh, but it is a passive platform, I will say that, because people are passively listening. The other one is I do like social media ads. So your Facebook, your Instagram, your TikTok. Um, Facebook, yeah. Instagram and TikTok are both very nice platforms. You get a good visual appeal going on. You can really engage people. And then also there's a platform right there for them to engage with you and say, hey, I just found your music. This is awesome. So that creates a nice camaraderie there. Those two are probably my top favorite digital advertising options. Um, but again, it also depends on what your goal is because <laughs> one is better than the other for certain things. Right. I guess like, like like we mentioned earlier, for a smaller, lesser known band, likely the best goal for you is going to be reach and getting your name out there. So mm -hmm. for that goal, that's probably what you're you're speaking to right now. Yes. But if you were more established and you really wanted to focus on selling your physical albums or something like that, then you might take a different strategy. Yeah, you might take a different strategy. You might do search ads. Um, you might do Spotify ads, which are quite expensive and probably should be one of the last campaigns that you do because that one 100% requires you to have a decent sized active audience because their ads are all built off of your existing um listeners. So people who have streamed your music or are streaming your music already. So you need to have a solid base before you even remotely start Spotify ads. Um, what do you think is the best way to boost Spotify numbers? This is, this is like a timeless, timeless dilemma, right? Cause bands just getting those monthly Spotify listeners up is a challenge. And I don't think we've ever had to, like my band is doing pretty well, thankfully, but that's because we've posted actively on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty much completely from TikTok audience. So if a band was trying to, let's say they're already doing that and they're still not seeing numbers on their Spotify, what do you think is the best way for them to market their music to increase their streaming number? You just said it, TikTok. Start a TikTok, build up to a thousand fans, and start doing TikTok lives. Um, the reason for this. So I know a lot of people like to do Instagram lives. 
When you do an Instagram live, you're going to reach 99% your current audience. When you do a TikTok live, you're going to reach 99% new people who have not followed you yet. Spiffy. And you're speaking directly to them. You can say, hey, guess what? Our new song is just about ready to hit 50,000 streams. Go help us. Go over to Spotify and stream this song. I have a friend that does this regularly and his Spotify numbers have seen a huge boost. And all he does is sit there and talk to people on TikTok. <laughs> well, that's terrifying though. Oh, no, it's not that bad. Just be sarcastic. It'll be fine. <laughs> as a fellow <laughs> as introvert, nervous, you should understand. Sarcasm. That's what I do. <laughs> as, um, as, as a fellow introvert, you should understand. <laughs> oh, I do. But that's why I just throw out the sarcasm and the snarkiness. It's fine. It's fine. Um, another good thing to do, and this is time consuming, but free. And most people wouldn't consider it marketing. When you're on your Instagram and somebody follows you, send them a quick, hey, thanks for following us. If you want to find more of our music, here is where to find it. And your top link should be Spotify. This is deceptively effective. You might not think it would be that effective. There are going to be people who are going to think you're a bot. But there will also be fans that are like, holy shit, this band just messaged me. And they'll go follow you on Spotify. It's time consuming, but it is free. And that's kind of the balance that you're striking with marketing is some things are going to be time consuming, but free. Some things are going to be quick, but they're really expensive. So when you're starting out, spend the time. Because the other thing that you're going to do while you're sending those little messages, and you can just have them saved to your desktop on a sticky note and just copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. And those people are going to be that much more engaged with your band. They're going to be that much more of a dedicated fan because they just got a personal message from you. And I would personalize them at least a little bit, include the person's name, like, hey, Jennifer, thanks for following us. Hey, Alex, thanks for the follow. Go check out our music. It's right here. And you'll get people who are like, holy hell, this is great. You're actually taking the time to message me. And those fans are going to be lifelong fans. Yeah, I really like that strategy also because you're um, you're messaging people who've already indicated an interest <laughs> by following you, right? It's like not the same as people that message everybody on their friends list. Hey, my band has a new single out. Go check it out here. Okay. Like, I mean, it's totally, it's a, it's a different mm -hmm. target audience, really. It's a different target audience. It's somebody who has shown interest in your music um, and you're reinforcing that interest by interacting with them. That's a really, really good point. Now, what are, do you have any other tips for getting the word out about your music? Do not we... discount having an email list. You should have a website set up. And on that website, you should have an email sign up. You can do this through MailChimp. You can do it through Constant Contact. I would recommend using one of the big uh, email list providers just because they integrate with websites very easily. Um, and make it very streamlined and kind of dummy proof. Uh, and every time you have a release, send out a blast. Every time you have a tour coming up, send out a blast. Don't always try to send out blasts where you're just um, trying to sell people things, but any, hey, we've entered the studio. So we've got new stuff coming up. Be excited. Just giving people little sneak peeks into the band. Um, and then obviously when you have new releases and everything, those people are already going to be engaged. They've already indicated that they want to hear from you. And you're again, reinforcing that relationship with those fans. And email marketing, even to this day, still has the highest ROI of any form of marketing. ROI is return on investment. So the money that you spend on email marketing, because those email providers, once you get a certain number of contacts, they're going to start charging. But the amount of money that you spend on those is um, much lower compared to the amount of money that you end up making by building those relationships and maintaining that healthy list. Do you think that bands need to have a lead magnet for those? Because I know lead magnets are super popular, but also like, I don't really know what to offer because... Uh, I mean, I know there's like some, you could release like, oh, well, here's a demo version of something that that's not out yet or something that is already out. But most of our music's already available on streaming. People can see so many pictures on social media and things like that. So it's like, what are you going to offer people? 
Uh, early sneak peeks is generally the the nice thing to offer people. I don't think it's 100% necessary, though, because you are the thing that you're offering. Your music is the thing that you're offering. And people have shown that they are interested in your music and that they are interested in you. So by signing up to that email list, you're already offering them what they've come for, which is right. Unique. Right. And early updates or whatever. It's like coming yeah, early updates, your inbox. first access to tours, that kind of stuff. Sign up for our mailing list. The benefit is you're on our mailing list. The benefit is you get to, you won't miss anything. The benefit is, is, oh crap. Uh, Shield of Wings put out a song four days ago. Where the hell was I? You won't have that problem. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I'm thinking back to when I signed up for like Epica's mailing list or within Temptations mailing list. I didn't, I didn't need anything, any no. incentive to sign up for it. I signed up because I want the updates. I want to know what's going on. So exactly. Same with me. When I sign up for a band's email list, let's take Black Braid, for example. Love Black Braid. I signed up for his email list. Why? Because I wanted to know the moment his vinyl was going to drop. And uh, I did. The website crashed. And because of just all of the people showing up, that was a very funny story. I ended up with two copies because the first one, I didn't think the transaction went through because the website crashed. So I went and I bought a different one and now I have two. Well, a, a good problem to have, I guess. Right? Oh yeah, it's, they're different. So it's great. I have a splatter one and a marble one and they're both beautiful. But that's the thing is people who sign up for your mail list, you don't have to offer them some sort of incentive because the incentive is they want your music. They want to know, oh, cool, they've they've dropped a new merch design. It's limited. I'm going to go grab that. Oh, their their album is being announced. And look, there's the uh, the pre-order. I want that. So you don't really need to offer much more than that. Yeah. And I feel like arguably those are the people you want on your mailing list. You yes. want the people that are going to open your emails that want to know what's going on. Exactly. Exactly. That is precisely correct. And then regularly cleaning your email list of people who aren't engaged, just a good practice to have so that, you know, you're not paying for people who don't really care about what you're saying. Yeah. Um, that's something a lot of people, that's something companies, professional companies do all the time. So, um, when I worked for big companies, if somebody hadn't opened an email from us in six months, we, they were deleted. When I worked for even bigger companies, it was three months. So. Well, and I think it might be different for bands if you're not sending out emails every, like every week, like big companies yeah. are though. It's not quite that same thing, but. But yeah, maybe. if somebody hasn't opened something from you in a year and you've sent out one a month, then they're probably not interested. So I'm going to change topics entirely unless there's something else you want to say about no, that. Go for it. What what do you think? This pub this episode is going to be published Tuesday, so we're going to find out if we're right. Um, what do you think Winter Sun's announcing tomorrow? Oh, Friday, geez, Friday, <laughs> January twelfth. Friday, January twelfth, Winter Sun. Let me hmm. Let me look at something really quick. No insider info allowed. No, no, no. I'm not <laughs> doing any insider info. I am just looking at a date really quick. Do, 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 do. Where is it? So their last album was in 2017. The album that came before that was in 2012. Album would be my bet. We <laughs> hope. We all hope. So yep. I don't know. Are you familiar with all of the Winter Sun lore then? I am not familiar with all the Winter Sun lore. Oh, Fill me in. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Basically, people have been waiting for, you see that the album released in 2017, no, the album before that was called Time, mm -hmm. and there was a Time 2. Mm -hmm. This album that came out, it was not finished, so it was, he released half of it, and there was supposed to be the rest of it, Time 2. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, this is the this is the explanation of why there's time one and time two. And so people have been waiting for it. And he ran a huge crowdfunding campaign. He earned like seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and gave people a different album, The Forest Seasons, um, as the reward for that crowdfunding campaign. But the incentive was people wanted time two, And so. The joke, the running joke is that um, time two will come out when George R.R. R. Martin finishes 
<laughs> the, the book series, <laughs> the Song of Ice and Fire series. So, uh, yeah, so we're all too, too afraid to hope that he's announcing that Time 2 is actually coming out. Um, and he I don't know teases if it'll be time all two, the time. But it might, you my know what? hope is it'll be an album. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, I think he's announced in the past that he's working on like four albums concurrently. So it, maybe it's one of the other three. Could be. It could be. Could but be. looking at their timeline, uh, they had eight years between albums, five years between albums, and then now we're at seven years. So you know what? It's kind of it's right in there. It's long overdue. That's for mm-hmm. sure. So we'll see. I mean, they haven't hit tool numbers yet on time between albums, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Like, we think they can have, like, five more years. It's fine. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, don't tell them that. <laughs> okay, Winter Sun, if you're listening to this podcast, announce the album. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, it'll be it'll be published after after the announcement on Friday anyway, so we'll see. Well, they can uh, announce it next Friday, then. If they don't, if they had, it's Friday. Yeah, right. <laughs> he, he's hyped it up so much. He's like, the biggest Winter Sun news is coming after the new year. And like, everybody's worried that he's like, he's just hyping us up for nothing, you know? So, we released we'll a new mug. Yeah, exactly. That's what people are expecting. <laughs> <laughs> like half people are expecting that. So we'll see. We mm-hmm. will see. We will see. What do you think is a good, like, Okay. You could answer this in multiple different ways. What do you think is the right amount of time between albums? It depends on the band. Um, I personally like about two years. That's kind of my um, personal preference as a fan. Uh, But if it's something particularly heavy, something that's a, a particularly emotionally weighty album when i say heavy i don't mean like the blast beats and the sick riffs and everything i mean like the emotions of it if it's that kind of band let's take aqualus for example and they had what 10 years between their two albums and i think that's okay because that is an album that like you're not going to listen to that on repeat you're going to listen to it once delve deep into the darkness of your worst depression get through that cathartic release and then you're going to put it away for a year. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, yeah. So it, it really depends. Yeah. Shout out to just... Aquilus, by the way, for creating some of the most beautiful neoclassical black metal out there. I'm going to have to check it out because I actually oh, dude, I'll know. send it to you. It's I fabulous. <laughs> it is. It is absolutely fabulous. I'm sure I will love it. Um, but I was listening to actually, um, I was listening to the Stoic Daily podcast um, and there was a compilation episode where he was talking to a bunch of comedians and he was talking to them about releasing specials. And one of the comedians mentioned that he meant he was talking to another comedian about releasing a special. And the comedian asked him, do you have an hour of material that you're in love with? No, then don't release a special. And so it's like this, uh, this, practice of patience with yourself Mm -hmm. to make sure that what you're releasing is stuff that you're in love with. When's the right time to release an album? When's the right time to, to release an album is when you have an album that you're a hundred percent in love with. Like I, I guess to an extent, I was going to say, there's a problem with that because people will be hypercritical of themselves that's and start to like the nitpick at the album. And then you're eight years down the road and it's still the same album. And you're like, should that note really be there? <laughs> yeah, right, right. But, you know, I, I at think, the same time, it's like, I think there's the whole like epidemic of bands that like their first album is great and then their second album isn't as good because they're giving themselves deadlines that they have to meet if they want to. It's like you have to find that perfect balance where you're 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 actually producing something, but it's good, too. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do see that a lot because they always um, make the joke of you have years to write the first album, you have six months to write the second. 
uh, just because of the timelines for releasing an album, you know, you have to have it into your distributor so early, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would almost, if you can swing this, if you're a band, start writing the second one while you're writing the first one. So say you're writing a 10, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> a 10 song album, write 14 songs that you love. And then you've got a head start, you've got a boost on your next album and you don't have to feel quite so rushed. You guys are creative. You have endless ideas and say some songs, say you write 15 songs and five of them don't make the cut, but you know what? They're still beautiful songs. There's still something that you're very proud of. There's something that you are in love with. They may have just not been cohesive for that album. They may have not fit the vibe for that album. Maybe they're a little bit darker than you wanted to go for your first album or a little bit more aggressive that you wanted to go for your first album. So you make those into the second one. There's nothing wrong with writing more material than you think you might need. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think this is a great place to end today's mm -hmm. conversation. So thank you for talking with me for this long about <laughs> your new situations and give, giving your insight on everything. Mm -hmm. Corey, much oh, appreciated. Course. And, and everyone I'll be back again, I'm sure. Oh, you Hopefully will be back. not going to let me disappear again. <laughs> I will not. I will not. Corey will be hosting the podcast every other week. Um, that's the plan right now. I mean, obviously, sometimes there might be shifts in the schedule, but the plan right now is to have her host co-hosting with me every other week. So if you ever have any questions for Corey, you can ask him and I can, you can put them in the comments and we'll ask him on the podcast. And um, yeah. But um, thank you for listening. And until next time, make like a bull and throw those horns up. And then...